Good morning. Good morning. So good to see you all again this morning. So glad to be with you this morning. So appreciative of the choice, the song selection this morning, as it fits very well with the subject that we are going to be addressing this morning. Psalm 23. Before we look at Psalm 23, I'd like to share with you another verse from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 12. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 12. And as we look at this verse, let's be reminded of who God is as it is defined within the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 12, it begins, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? We recognize that it is God who created the sea. In terms of surface, the surface of the earth, do you realize that 70% of the earth is covered with ocean? This verse says that it is God who measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. The verse goes on to describe that he measured heaven with a span. What is a span? A span is essentially the space between the thumb to the tip of the pinky. That's a span. And we look at the heavens around us and realize how vast this universe is. That the fact of the matter is, is that it takes light traveling at 186,000 miles per second, 120,000 years to go from one edge of our galaxy to the other. And we also realize there are millions, billions of galaxies even beyond our own. And yet all of that God measured between the thumb and the pinky. The verse goes on to say that he calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. According to one measurement, there is approximately 7 quadrillion, 500 quadrillion grains of sand on the world's beaches. I'd like to know who counted those sands. That's a lot of sand. But it says that God was the one who measured that sand. God knows how many there are. The verse goes on to say that he weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. If you were to take a football field and were to stand it upright, it would take about 10,000 of them to reach the very top of Mount Everest. It was God who put it all together. That's the God that we serve. Now, take that verse and let's just back up one verse. Verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Here is a great, majestic, and powerful God who brought the heavens and the earth into existence, who by his spoken word in all his greatness and power had said, let there be light, and there was light. This great and majestic God is also a gentle God who wants to be your shepherd. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, the first few words that we read in verse number 1. The Lord is my shepherd. We mentioned this yesterday. The word Lord, all caps, that's the tetragrammaton. That's the great I am. That's the covenant name of God. But then also look at the personal pronoun that's used. The Lord is my shepherd. Does God know your name? Is he interested and involved in your life? Again, 
the God said, let there be light, is the same God who wants to be personally involved in your life. But then it has the word shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Over and over again, we read about shepherd within the Bible. Jesus is our shepherd, John chapter 10. The elders are shepherds, 1 Peter chapter 5. Here the Lord is our shepherd. And it carries the idea of one who is interested in you, cares about you, and is protective of you. And so as we read Psalm 23, I ask the question, what does it mean for God to care for us? What does it mean for God to be our shepherd? I believe that when the Lord is my shepherd, my life is so much better. And my life is better because of three reasons. And all three of these reasons are found right here in Psalm 23. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have contentment. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have courage. And then third of all, we're going to see that when the Lord is my shepherd, I have confidence. Now let's watch how these things play out within this psalm. Look at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have contentment. God provides for me my material needs. He provides for me my emotional needs. He provides for me my spiritual needs. As far as the needs that I have with God as my shepherd, I don't need anything. There is a contentment that I have when the Lord is my shepherd. Now watch how this imagery is played out and fleshed out in verses 2 and 3. Verse number 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. The Hebrew word translated as green pastures suggests new grass that's just started to sprout up from, from a fertile soil. Here are the sheep and they're laying down in green pastures and they're fully fed and they're fully satisfied. Verse number 2, he leads me beside the still waters. And the word still is a word that suggests a peaceful kind of water. Verse number three, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And the idea of restore carries this idea of being refreshed. Let me ask you, do you feel stressed sometimes? Have you worked hard? Have you ever found that, man, I need a vacation? And then you go on vacation and you feel so much better. You feel refreshed. And that's the idea of this word restored. He restores my soul. And so the sheep are satisfied. The sheep are at peace. The sheep are refreshed. And the reason why they have this great sense of contentment is because God is their shepherd. Let's look at a couple of verses as far as what the Bible says in reference to shepherd, to contentment rather. In Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Sometimes we use the expression, enough is enough. Question, how much is enough? Alexander the Great was a man known as a world conqueror. Legend has it that Alexander the Great made a request before he died. His request was that he wanted to be buried with his hands sticking up out of the ground. And the reason why he wanted to do that is because he wanted all the world to see as they passed by that even though Alexander the Great was a great world conqueror, 
he left this world empty-handed. How can I learn contentment? What's the secret of contentment? I learn contentment by appreciating and being grateful for the things that God has provided. In the beginning, Adam and Eve were placed in this beautiful garden and they were given everything they could ever want. And in the midst of this beauty, God had only given them one restriction and that restriction was this, don't eat of the fruit of the tree that was in the midst of the garden, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember that? But remember how Satan had presented himself And Satan had convinced them to give in to temptation and to go ahead and eat of that forbidden fruit. And you look at that and you ask the question, why would Adam and Eve, who had such abundance, why would Adam and Eve, who had everything they could ever want from God, why would they give in to that temptation? And we we know from verse number 6 that they gave in to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But back up, if you will, to verses 4 and 5. And I want you to notice what Satan had said to them. Verses 4 and 5 of Genesis chapter 3, Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Yes, they gave in to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. May I make a suggestion? Maybe they gave in the temptation because they were not appreciative of the things that they were given. They listened to the serpent and they saw that there was something they did not have. If you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God. You know, God's holding out on you. If you eat of this fruit, you're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. God's withholding something of value that you want, something that you deserve to have. And so instead of being appreciative of what they did have, they longed for the things they did not have, and so they heeded the words of Satan. Today, there are weeds in your garden, and there is pain in childbirth, Because Adam and Eve did not appreciate the blessings that they had. You know, we have been blessed all of our lives. Everything that we have, we have from our jobs, from the clothes that we wear, from the very gift of salvation and forgiveness. We recognize these things as a gift from God. Romans chapter 8, verse number 32, it describes how God, who has given us his Son, will he not freely give us all things? In James chapter 1, verse number 17, every good and perfect gift comes from above. We recognize all things that God has given to us. I tell you, we give honor to our parents. We have Mother's Day, and we have Father's Day. And on these days, we express our great gratitude to them for all that they've done for us, for loving us, for providing for us, for keeping us safe, for educating us, and yet we forget to give God that same honor who does that for us every single day. We have sin that we have committed, that we have been forgiven of that sin. All of it made possible because of the gift of His Son, Jesus. When I am grateful for what God has done for me, you know what that does? That gives me a sense of contentment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Second of all, When the Lord is my shepherd, I not only have contentment, I shall not want. But when the Lord is my shepherd, number two, I have courage. Look at verse number four. Psalm 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
This phrase, the shadow of death, is an interesting phrase. It's not literally the idea of a shadow, but more carries the idea of the darkest of nights. Have you ever had dark days in your life? We can have courage because we know that God is with us. Let's look at a couple of passages as far as what the Bible says of courage. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 10. And in Matthew chapter 10, we read a passage in a context where Jesus warns about those who will rise up against you. There are those who rise up against you that will include those of your own household, verse 21. You'll be hated, verse 22. You'll be persecuted, verse 23. And all of this will come, Jesus says, because of your association with me. Nevertheless, you must still preach the things I tell you to preach. Well, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to be out there preaching the gospel and telling people about Jesus when I know that there are going to be those who want to harm me, who want to speak evil of me, who want to throw me in jail, who even want to take my life? Look at verse, 30, uh, verse number 26. He said to them, and I'm in the book of Luke, which is why it didn't look familiar to me. <laughs> Let's go back to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 26. That looks more familiar. <laughs> Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Skip down to verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to both destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Skip down to verse 31. Do not fear, therefore, you are more, of more value than many sparrows. Over and over again, Jesus says, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. And that leads right into verses 32 and 33, a passage I know we're very familiar with. Verse 32, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Look at the context. We often use this passage to make the point of, well, if I want to have salvation, I have to stand up and make a verbal confession before others. And that's absolutely true. But here in a context, we're finding Jesus telling these individuals, if you want to be my disciple, you need to make sure you don't fear. Preach the message. Tell people who I am. And don't fear. And you have to make this verbal confession. What I'm reading about is not just a, an occasional verbal acknowledgement of Christ. What I'm reading about is a lifestyle. These were people who were standing up for Christ even though they were hated, and even though they were persecuted, and they were doing it without fear. Jesus Christ is the center of my life, and he will be the center of my life. I don't care what you do to me, they were saying. So we have this concept of fear, and what the Bible tells us about fear. The story is told of a mother who went to tuck in her little boy into bed that night. There happened to be a thunderstorm that was raging, and the boy had asked, Mama, can you sleep with me tonight? The mom said, No, my place is in bed with, with your daddy. I need to sleep with him tonight. And as she leaves the room, turns off the lights, she heard her little boy say under his breath, in reference to her dad, reference to his dad, What a sissy. <laughs> how can I be more courageous I can be more courageous because the Lord is my shepherd and I need to learn to trust and put my faith in him in 1st Timothy excuse me 2nd Timothy chapter 1 verse number 7 for the Lord has not given us 
a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now the word used here for the word fear is not the usual word that you find for fear. It's not phobos like phobia. It is delios. And that's the word that we come up with that means cowardice. God has not given to us a a spirit of cowardice. When the Lord is my shepherd, I don't have to live as a coward. He has given me instead a spirit of power, and that power moves me so that I can trust and put my faith in Him. Do you have phobia? Do I have phobia? Absolutely, I do. But cowardice? I don't have to be a coward because the Lord is my shepherd. Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we find this passage in which the disciples were with Jesus on the water. A storm had hit. And as a result of the storm, the disciples were afraid. You remember that the, the disciples had gone to Jesus and had said to Jesus, save us. And then in Luke chapter 8, verse number 25, I want you to listen to what Jesus had asked them. But he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who could this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Here we have a storm. The disciples are in the boat. They're afraid. Jesus is asleep. Lord, save us. Jesus responded, where is your faith? There are dark days. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I have to confess, sometimes I'm afraid. There are times when fear grabs hold of me like you would not believe. I believe in God with all of my heart. I believe that God is my protector. I believe that God is involved in my life. But sometimes I feel like these disciples. Lord, please save us. And perhaps the question that we need to be asking ourselves as I ask myself Where is your faith? That's why I'm comforted by passages like Psalm 23, verse 4. When God is on my side, I don't have to live in fear. And when there are times when I am afraid, it helps me to be reminded of the fact that the Lord is my shepherd. I don't have to be afraid because God is with me. And so when the Lord is my shepherd, I have contentment. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have courage. And number three, when the Lord is my shepherd, I have confidence. Skip down to verse number seven of Psalm 23. Verse number 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you see the confidence? I know that my relationship with God is secure. And I know my relationship with God is secure. And I know that I have a home waiting for me in heaven because the Lord is my shepherd. What does the Bible say about confidence? 1 John chapter 5, verse number, 20, uh, verse number 13, rather. These things I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Let me ask you a question. Do you know that you are saved? Notice I didn't ask. Do you think that you're saved? I didn't ask, do you hope that you're saved? 
But at this very moment, as you sit there in your pew as a Christian, as a baptized believer in Christ, if the Lord were to come right now, do you know that you would go to heaven? The Apostle John wrote, These things I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know? Now you might say, well, I don't want to answer that question in the positive with a yes, because, well, I don't want to sound arrogant. No, not arrogant, confident. I'm afraid that for too long we've been walking around on eggshells, and we're afraid to say, yes, I am saved, because we don't have to feel like that, like we're walking on eggshells. The Bible says that you and I can have the confidence in our relationship with God. We can know that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I have that confidence. How do I make sure that I have that confidence? I can be more confident when I see the shepherd, my Lord, as a God of grace. You know, the most, I suppose, the most comprehensive chapters in the Bible in reference to the subject of grace is Ephesians chapter 2. If I want to know something about grace and I want to know what grace is all about, I go to Ephesians chapter 2. That's where grace is found. Three times in ten verses, I read the word grace. I find it in verse 5. I find it in verse 7. I find it in verse 8. And as I read these verses, I gain a better appreciation of this God who is my shepherd. And I recognize him as a God of grace. And that gives me the confidence in my relationship with God and my security in my home in heaven. And as I read these verses, I find that there's the definition of grace. Do you like the mark in your Bibles? You may want to underline or circle three words that are in this text. Notice verse number four, but God who is rich in mercy. If you like to mark in your Bibles, circle or underline the word mercy. Verse number four, keep reading, because of his great love with which he loved us. Circle, underline the word love. Skip down to verse seven, that, the ages, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Circle or underline kindness. Now you've just circled or underlined three words. Mercy, love, kindness. And that's the definition of grace. That the grace of God is a, a grace that consists of three components. It is his mercy, it is his love, and it is his kindness. We don't have time to look at it, but go over to Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, and you're going to see the same three words used in reference to grace, except in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, it's reversed. In Titus 3, verses 4 and 5, it's kindness, love, mercy. In Ephesians 2, it's mercy, love, kindness. But these are the components of God's grace. Now watch how all of this comes together. I have made a spiritual mess out of my life. Trespasses and sins, verse number 1 of Ephesians 2. God sees me in this condition and he feels compassion toward me, mercy. He acts in a way that is in my best interest, love. And he does so because he has a gentle spirit toward me, kindness. And it is, an, it is, it is in his mercy, his love, and his kindness, his grace that led him to offer salvation to me. But what does this mercy, love, and kindness of God do for me? Skip down to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to notice verses 8 and 9. Actually, we're probably just going to stick with 8. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Stop there. You don't have to do 
one thing to earn God's grace. My salvation that comes because of the mercy, the love, and the kindness of God was made available through Jesus Christ. I am eligible to receive the grace of God not because of who I am, not of yourselves. It's not because of anything I do, not of works. It's not because of who I am or what I do. It's because of who God is and because of what God has done. He continues in verse 8. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. It's not something that I deserve. We sometimes ask the question, have I done enough? How much more do I need to do in order to make sure that my home in heaven is secure? Wrong question. This. I am eligible and I am saved and I know that my home in heaven is secure not because of how much I study my Bible. It's not because of how many people I help. It's not because of all the things that I have done that has compelled God to do what he has done by rewarding me with a home in heaven. So how do I receive the grace of God, the gift of God? Notice again verse number 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Don't miss the word faith. You see, it isn't God feeling love and mercy and kindness to me that He just given it to me without me doing anything. But it is God feeling that way toward me, yes, but then offering me that free gift of salvation on the condition of my faith. Is that not what we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 1? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes these words. Therefore, having been just as if I'd never sinned, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the first word in that verse? That's therefore. Well, that encourages me to go back into chapter 4 to find out about the context. And when I go back into chapter 4, I read about Abraham. And I read about how Abraham had faith. And what I find in chapter 4 is a detailed explanation and definition of how God defines faith. And in chapter 4, I, re I read about Abraham who had a faith that accepted what God said as facts. Verse number 3. I read about a faith that Abraham had in which he trusted in God. Verse 21. I read about a faith that Abraham had in which he acted upon what God said in obedient faith. Verses 18 and 19. And now read what the Holy Spirit directed Paul to say in Romans chapter 4 verse number 12. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Listen to what he's saying. If you want salvation, if you want to be justified, you've got to have faith. But what kind of faith? We go back to chapter 4 and he says, you need to have the kind of faith that Abraham had. Well, what kind of faith did Abraham have? He had the faith that accepted. He had a faith that trusted. And he had a faith that obeyed. And when we have that same kind of faith, the faith that Abraham had, a faith that accepts what God says, a faith that trusts in God, and a faith that does what God says we need to do, then what's the result? Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. We are justified by faith, not because we have earned it, but because 
I believe what God says. And God says, if you do this, this, and this, then I will save you. And so I have confidence in my salvation because I appreciate the grace of God and how much he was willing to offer his son so that I can have that salvation. I am confident that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because God is my shepherd as a shepherd of grace. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I have contentment. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not fear. I have courage. The Lord is my shepherd. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have confidence. And so I have benefits in my life because the Lord is my shepherd. Perhaps you've heard the story of the two speakers. One was a well-trained orator. He stood in front of the audience and he read Psalm 23. And he read it with perfect clarity. The words rolled off his tongue with such grace, such eloquence, that when he was done, the audience gave him a standing ovation. The next speaker stood up and he was an older preacher. He did not read Psalm 23. He quoted it. He was not as eloquent as the professional orator. He sometimes flubbed a word. He sometimes stumbled, sometimes stuttered. But when he was done, there was not a dry eye in the house. Someone from the back had stood up and asked the question, what was the difference between the two speakers? The MC made his way back up to the podium to answer the question. He said, here's the difference. The first speaker knew Psalm 23. The second speaker knew the shepherd. Do you know the shepherd? God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who made everything that we now enjoy today is the God who wants a relationship with you and wants to be your shepherd. And he has extended to us the gift of salvation because of his love, his kindness, and his mercy toward us, grace. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to suffer and die on the cross for us. So that when we respond to the gospel invitation by faith, a faith that accepts, a faith that trusts, a faith that obeys, and so that we confess our faith in Jesus after repenting of our sins of the past, and we become buried in the waters of baptism, come up out of that water Christian, and we have contentment, and we can have courage, and we can have that confidence. If you're here as someone who is not a Christian, that invitation is to you. If you're here as someone who's already a Christian, but you've allowed yourself to stray away from the shepherd, you can make your life right with God this morning, repenting of your sins and seeking God's forgiveness. Invitation is open to all. If you're subject, we invite you to come forward.